The psalm before us is one of the most amazing of all the psalms and one of the most important prophetic chapters in the entire Bible. One readily notices the very words of Christ from the cross here over a thousand years, quoted by the psalmist over a thousand years before that event. Like the famous 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah, it is absolutely, unmistakably, uh, who it is as to whom this is referring, the Lord and Savior, the coming Savior, Jesus Christ. And while David suffered in the extreme at the hand of the embittered and cruel King Saul, none of the events recorded here could apply to David uh, they, uh, or to his years in exile or anything that he went through as king of Israel. While it is a psalm of David, the superscription tells us, telling us, who the human author is, David is being led by the Holy Spirit to foretell the experiences of another, and yet it is so vivid, so real, it seems as if he's enduring them himself. He pens the very words of Christ, Jesus, the Son of God, who would suffer in our place and for our sins. Before us is a perfect example of biblical prophecy the Old Testament prophet had to have a 100% accuracy. He could not have 90% accuracy of his prophets or 99% of them. In fact, the uh, punishment for not being 100% accurate under the Mosaic law was stoning. And so we see the accuracy of the scripture here. What is vividly and heart-wrenching in description here is the sufferings of the coming Christ upon the cross of Calvary. In actuality, we have a more graphically detailed description of those events than even the gospel writers give us. What we see here is the, the perfect and the guidance, the perfection and the guidance of the Holy Spirit as the New Testament tells us that the prophecy of Scripture, the Old Testament Scripture, came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God were moved. They spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, Peter tells us in 2 Peter 1.21. Some have referred to Psalm 22 as the holy of holies of Scripture, revealing and uh, lifting the veil of what was going on between the Son on the cross and the Father in heaven as our Lord hung, suspended those hours on the cross as the hymn writer tells us, lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah. What a Savior. What the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God discussed and planned in eternity past. When the full plan of redemption was devised, is divulged in part for us here. We are privy to the most intimate thoughts and the emotions of the Son of God as he suffered on the cross for our sins. We're given here more detail, as I've mentioned, than the gospel writers give us. Some say the reason they give such scant information is because they had no need to dwell upon that which was commonly known and received among them, because those things were openly and widely known by everyone in their day. Some have surmised that Christ no doubt quoted this entire chapter on the cross as he was hanging and suffering in our place. I want us to take the chapter and we'll divide it in this way. First of all, I want us to examine the painful cry of abandonment in verses 1 through 6. And then in verses 7 through 10, the pitiful abuse by man, by mankind, the created, you know, crucifying the cre creator. And then lastly, the power of intercession of our Savior in verses 22 through 31. But first of all, we hear it begins the very first note, the very first verse of the painful cry of abandonment. My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? The psalm begins with a cry, but praise his name. It ends with a promise. Look at the, the, the last verse. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born. That's us. 
in this audience today and all those who came afterwards that he hath done this. He hath completed this. It is finished. And this is the glorious, glorious promise. There are some 33 clear prophecies here in this psalm which are fulfilled at Calvary. And while that will not be our emphasis this morning, it's a wonderful Bible study to look at that, and I would encourage you to do so. But here is a clear sign, as we've mentioned, of inspiration, the infallibility of the Bible. For the things foretold 1,000 years before to be fulfilled with 100% accuracy to the very words that our Lord would utter from the cross, only God can do that. Abandoned, left, forsaken. The worst of human experience, no doubt, is to be left alone. And it denotes not only being left alone, but an intentional abandoning, a planned and on purpose abandoning the one abandoned. Our Lord was rejected by men and left alone even by his father at Calvary. And immediately the question arises, why? Why would God the Father abandon the Son? Remember the great high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, restore us to the glory which we had before the beginning, before the Son took on flesh and became one of us, that you and I are one. We've never been divided, and yet, as he was praying those words, he looked ahead to the bitter hour, the bitter cup, when he would cry, full well, full knowledge. This is no surprise to the Savior. My God, my God, why? Why hast thou forsaken me? The reason, the writer, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 tells us, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Oh, the glorious exchange. My sin for his righteousness. We had no righteousness of our own. We, our best is filth in the sight of a thrice holy God. Isaiah records it in Isaiah 64 verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing. And all of our righteousnesses, if you pile them all up together here in a big pile, everything that we could lay hold on to good and moral and clean and righteous are as filthy rags. And we do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, are, have taken us away. And there is none that calleth on thy name. What an indictment on all of humanity. No one would ever call on the name of the Lord had they not been called. No one calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us and consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O oh Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay. And thou art our potter. And we are all the work of thine hand. Here is the bitter cup that Jesus would pray about in Gethsemane as the choir so beautifully sang for us this morning. Rejection and abandonment by his father. It was more than Christ in his humanity could bear. And he did not turn from the thorns and the, the beatings and the, the, the nails in his hands, what he was praying for, what he dreaded, if you will, in his humanity, was the abandonment. His father abandoning him for our stead in our place. He cries in Matthew 26, verse 39, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death, so that the capillaries in his body burst, and he sweat out great drops of blood under the weight of this bitter cup. Tarry ye here and watch with me, asked the disciples. None of them did. They all fell asleep. One of the most pitiful things in all the Bible is those men who'd been right with him were sleeping during this worst hour of his life, far more worse than the hours that he would hang suspended between heaven and earth. And he went a little further and he fell on his face and prayed, 
saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup, this cup of abandonment, this cup of you turning your back on me as I fulfill the plan that we set out in eternity past, let that cup pass from me. Nevertheless, he knows it cannot. That's Christ and his humanity. Nevertheless, the last part of that prayer is a, a prayer of submission. We all must pray this prayer in the daily round of life, the disappointments of life, the path sometimes that the will of God takes us that we would never take, never choose, never go down. We ought to always pray as our Savior prayed, nevertheless. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. That ought to be on the heart and the lips of every child of God every day. Nevertheless, Lord, this is what I desire. We must pray this way. Even as we're proclaiming the promises of God, Lord, this is how I see it. And this is, if this be your will, but we ought to always say, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Well, look in verse 3 and see why. The Bible tells us here, but thou art holy. I don't think in our human state as we now are, that we can ever fully comprehend God's holiness. And I wonder even as redeemed, perfected ones in eternity, will we fully be able to comprehend the absolute holiness of God. It is the first attribute of God which we almost un all must understand, and I fear so few ever come to even the brim of comprehending the holiness of God, everything else we believe falls in under the grand doctrine of the perfection, the holiness of our God. Absolutely set apart and unlike anything else in creation, for he is uncreated and eternal and without fault, without sin. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Habakkuk tells us, tucked away in that little prophet's book, Habakkuk 1, verse 13, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look upon iniquity as he became the sin offering for us, bearing every thought, word, and action that we ever did or will do, it was nailed to his cross and poured out on him there in judgment. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore, lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. Here in the middle of the day, the sun is black as midnight. I think it was John Phillips that said that, as the crowds were gawking at our Lord, beaten to a pulp and absolutely naked before their eyes, that God the Father mercilessly threw a blanket of darkness so they could not behold His Son. In the middle of the day, when it became black as midnight, the Lamb of God roars. We do not think of a roaring Lamb, but He roars out the lament of His agony. My God! My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Greater than the pain of the nails and of the thorns was the horror of the abandonment of his father for me, for you, to accomplish our salvation. There was no other way. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Please never think for one moment that Christ didn't want to go to Calvary, that he did not want to purchase his bride. There was no other way. Amen. Oh, it was the bitter cup of abandonment of God the Father turning away his face from looking upon his son, whom he had only pronounced from heaven and only always, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It is an orphan's cry. 
yet one who has been deliberately and purposefully left behind. Crying out, Daddy, you've forsaken me. Our Lord and our Savior was absolutely holy. He lived a life we could never live and that no human could ever attain to. One in perfect obedience to the word of God, to the law of God, and in perfect harmony with the will of God. He never violated it, never sinned in thought, word, or deed. But we look in the mirror if you want to see depravity and honestly look down deep in your own heart and life, look in the mirror of your soul and see that we have sinned in all those ways. We've sinned in thought and in word and in deed. And God's word declares, for whosoever shall keep the whole law. We hear people say, I keep the Ten Commandments, I keep the law, yet offend in one point. Did you ever take a penny, a cookie? If you always 100% told the truth to your mother, your father, your... No, no, no. You see, the problem is we lower the standard to say a penny is not stealing and a cookie means nothing. But God, who invented right and wrong, says the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And to offend in one point, we are guilty of all. We cannot clothe ourselves in that robe of self-righteousness. It is full of holes and is nasty with filth in the sight of a holy God. At his baptism and at his transfiguration, his father declared from heaven, this is my son. Oh, so proud. He's fulfilling all righteousness. He has and will do all that I've appointed him to do. This is my beloved son. Can you imagine hearing the voice of the father from heaven? Here he is. That's him. I am well pleased. Oh, every son longs to hear that word from their father. But on the cross... Our Lord took upon him the debt that each of us owed to the triune God's perfect holiness and fulfilled for us in his 33 years of living sinlessly on earth. In a few hours on the cross, he paid our debt in full. One that would take us an eternity in hell to pay and still we would be at the very beginning and have to do it all over again and never attain to that place of righteousness. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, his cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul, I want to report to you today on the authority of the word of God and as a preacher of this glorious gospel that our Lord drank every drop of that cruel cup on our behalf and in our stead. He turned the cup up and drained it at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. Oh, there my burdened soul found liberty. Where? One place. At Calvary. As one has said, he was tasting death for us, experiencing what every lost soul will experience in hell for all eternity, what it meant to be abandoned by God in the dark. Secondly, I want us to notice not only the painful cry of abandonment, but I want you to see the pitiful abuse by man. And time will not allow me. And I don't think the grotesqueness of our curiosity should dwell there, but we should never forget of the physical agony that our salvation cost the Son of God. And we see it so beautifully, for lack of better words, poignantly given to us in verses 7 through 10. 
Look at what he says in verse 6. What an interesting term. You used to see it a lot in old hymn books. I'm afraid that they've taken it out of most today. But I am a worm. What a description. The glorious Son of God calls himself a worm. For such a worm as I, the song says. I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men. He's looking prophetically when he's hanging there on the cross and despised of the people. We will not have this man to rule over us. We have no king but Caesar. They hated Caesar. But all of a sudden they become faithful Roman citizens. We will not have this man to reign over us. And that's the cry of the masses today. We will not have this man to rule. He's not going to run my life. I'll run my life. I know what to do. I'm not going to obey that Bible or, or hang out with those people. I'll not associate with the banner of Christ. I'll not have him to reign over me. I'll make my own choices, thank you very much. No, you're not. You're making the choices of your father, the, the devil. You're a puppet in his hands. You believe the lie that you're in control. The word for worm here in the Hebrew was used by the crimson crocus from which the scarlet dye was taken, pressed out, and taken to, to dye the crimson garments of the nobility. Only the very rich could afford it. The lowly worm had to be crushed for that transaction to be made. Jesus was crushed by the weight of all of our sin laid upon him. God's wrath against our sin was poured out on him. And his crimson blood poured out to purchase for us his royal robes of righteousness. Not for works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. We're now clothed in his very own righteousness. And by faith, his perfect record is on record in the heavenly courtroom. You just go check and see. Someone has said the eternal son, creator of every star, every atom, abandoned by God, became a worm and no man for our redemption. Amen. Amazingly, the 22nd Psalm gives the exact wording of what our Lord his accusers and detractors would say there that day at Calvary. How would he know? How would he know what the masses are going to, to, to cry out? Those masses could not orchestrate a thousand years later. This is what we'll say to fulfill scripture. Notice his enemies are saying these things. The last thing they would want to do is to be accused of fulfilling prophetic scripture about Jesus. His enemies fulfilled every prophecy unwittingly that's how prophecy works it is the will of God in spite of the will of man yeah. see how cruel they treat the darling of heaven angry bulls or fierce creatures I <clears throat> would hate to be chased by one wouldn't you we see it from time to time charging at the least provocation their horns like razor knives and swords goring the person or the thing if they can and then we see the description of wild ravening dogs dogs were not loved or kept in this time they were packs of wild animals they would often come near the place of crucifixion hoping to get a piece of meat hoping to help devour the corpses if no one claimed them the ravening dogs but he was not speaking of the ravening dogs of Gehenna on that trash pile on the outside of Jerusalem he was speaking of the religious leaders who are wanting a piece of him dogs have compassed they've surrounded me Notice the unbelievable heartlessness of his persecutors. Verse 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots for my vesture. The Roman soldiers of all people did this despicable deed. Godly Christians down through the ages have absolutely shunned gambling for the very reason before us. And you may think it quaint, but this horrible, horrible act has stood in their minds down through the ages, the heartless treatment of their Lord. These were the only material belongings left to him. He whose throne is above the heavens, whose earth 
the, his footstool is the earth, was reduced to this. And while he died to pay the cost of salvation, they gambled for his worn sandals, his belt, his tunic, his vesture, his cloak. And we read there in verse 14, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. They had to be to keep breathing. His bones, would, his legs and arms would be dislocated. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to, to the, my jaws. He cries out, I thirst. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Verse 17, I may tell all my bones. Every bone of his was exposed and could be seen as he hung there, stretched to the, to the limit. Gazing, the gaping and fiendish pleasure over his horrible suffering, which they demanded. See them gathered around, the members of the Sanhedrin, the scribes, the elders, the priests. Hear their jokes, their jeers, as our Lord was stripped and hung, exposed before them all. We see in verse 19, but be thou not far from me, O Lord, my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. This is referring to Satan, the lion's mouth. He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And if he could have devoured Jesus on the cross, he would have. This was his final hope to destroy him, to do away with him. And he hoped that he would secure his death, but his death did not take away the hope of his resurrection. This isn't all. All of a sudden, the emphasis changes from a minor key to a major key in verses 22 through 31, and we must hasten here. We here see the power of intercession of our Savior. Our Lord had more power with his na hands nailed to the cross and his feet nailed to the cross than anyone else ever has ever had. And here he's praying for us. The suffering Savior becomes our intercessor, and he reminds us that he will one day be our coming king. As priest, he ever intercedes at the throne of his father on our behalf. We heard it so beautifully sung this morning, showing his wounds and answering every accusation of the believer. The soul that sinneth, it shall die, Satan hisses, but the Son of God says, here I've died for them. His earthly life was spent as a prophet for telling and fulfilling the word of God. He was the word who took on flesh and became one of us. His present ministry, even now as we meet here, is our great high priest. He intercedes on our behalf today. He continually shows his wounds because the wicked one is continually accusing us. And guess what? Whatever he accuses is true. He didn't have to make up anything. Oh, the accusations are real. But soon he will return as our reigning king. He fulfills all offices, the only one who could do this, prophet, priest, and king. Verse 22 foretells his resurrection. Look there. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation while I praise thee. He speaks to his brethren, the church, those gathered today. David did not know of the coming fellowship of the brethren in the church, the body of Christ. It was a secret. It was a mystery to the Old Testament saints. Even now, our Lord is praising God the Father in and among his brethren. The church gathered there, those who've gone on before, the great cloud of witnesses. They're meeting in heaven praising, even as we meet here in praise. And there's a great unity when the church on earth and the church in heaven are gathered and praising his name. And I remind us today where two or three are gathered. Do you know where Jesus is today? He's at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, making intercession. But he's also, because of his omnipresence, wherever two or three believers are gathered, there I am in the midst of them. Amen. Oh, what a privilege. This is not just going to church. We've come to meet with the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's with us. 
verses 23 through 26 foretells his return. There are three groups of people who will be affected by his return. I want to remind us in closing this morning. The Jews, the nation of Israel here depicted at the end of the great tribulation, Messiah returns to redeem his ancient people. They will look on him whom they've pierced. Amen. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. Then we see the church in verse 25. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. Oh, it's a number no man can number. Think of the great congregation of the Lord, of all the saved. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The great congregation gathered from every tribe and nation, Revelation tells us, revealed and glorified before all. Verse 26 speaks of the nations. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. Our Lord prayed, paid the redemptive price for his people, and he shall have his reward, his bride. And we see in verse 27, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. All the kindreds of every nation shall worship before thee. And then in verse 28, the kingdom is the Lord's. And he is the governor among the nations. In verse, uh, we see him there reigning and ruling over the nations. See him ruling today. We long to see him, king of kings and lord of lords, with every knee bowing and every tongue confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. As the millennial rules, descends on the earth, his story and his glory and his glorious work will be told from generation to generation. Look what he's done. He's purchased us. He has saved us. He has redeemed us. And now he has glorified us. In verse 31, they shall come and they shall declare his righteousness unto people that shall be born that he hath done this. And so we stand here by faith in that coming day and declare him to you today. This is the Savior the promised Son of God, the seed of woman who has come to undo all the first Adam did. The first Adam lost it all, didn't he? The second Adam has regained it all. And we shall be restored. We have been redeemed. We are being saved. We will be glorified. Praise his holy name. Let me ask you, have you believed on him? Have you turned from your sin, turned from yourself, and come to Christ as Savior and Lord the Bible promises to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to as many as believed on his name. Oh, he's done it all. And if you have an interest in what you've heard today, that is his spirit drawing you to Jesus Christ. Go to him. We cannot save you. None of us can save you. But the Savior is here. Where two or three are gathered, there he is in the midst. He's here. He will meet you here. Call on his name for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Bless his holy name forever. Oh, Lord, we praise you for the glorious gospel of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you bless, Lord, these efforts to declare him? We never do it justice, Lord. But I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit of God, who moved David to pen these words, is in our midst today and can fully reveal the Savior to that one who needs him today. Oh, there he is with nail-pierced hands reaching for you. Would you receive him and make him your Lord and your Savior? Would you bless your gospel today, Lord, in Jesus' name? Amen.